Words, words in books, words on TV, words for cooks, words for comfort, words for peace, words to make the fighting cease, words to tell Welcome to the world of Wordaholics. Hard for you. Hello, I'm Giles Brandreth, and this is Wordaholics, the show all about language that never uses one word where many, myriad, various, umpteen, multitudinous will do, suffice, serve, meet requirements, satisfy, fit the bill. I could go on like this all day and play your cards right. I will. <laughs> Joining me are four fellow Wordaholics. They are Lloyd Langford, Natalie Haynes, Holly Walsh, and Paul Sinner. Before we start round one, let's find out a little more about our assembled wordaholics and the language they love. First, let me welcome Lloyd Langford. Lloyd, as well as being a successful stand-up comedian, I think I'm right in saying you are a big fan of Kung Fu, the films. Are, are there any words from the vocabulary of Kung Fu that you're particularly fond of? <laughs> a lot of the, the, the fighting styles are named after different animals. So, um, for example, the crane fighting style, that's named because the punches are, are quick and swift, like a bird feeding. There's leopard style, which is uh, very uh, quick and kind of low down. And there's also uh, monkey style, uh, where you get your bum out and <laughs> check your opponent's head for fleas. <laughs> Are you planning to adopt one of those styles for the show? Well, let's see how it goes. <laughs> Next to Lloyd is our regular classicist, Natalie Haynes, who since the last series has published her first novel. Yay. So, yeah, well done, Natalie. Yay. Yay, well, done. <laughs> well, now, Natalie, as, as a novelist now, which words do you use to ensure that readers keep turning the pages? I guess the main one would probably be and... <laughs> that, that's gone pretty well for me so far um, if that stops working I'm going to start writing PTO on the bottom of every other page see how that goes for me next uh, I turn to the comedian and writer Holly Walsh co-creator of BBC Three's prison sitcom Dead Boss prison has a language all its own also I've been told by some of my former parliamentary colleagues <laughs> Holly, do you have any favourite pieces of prison slang? I think there's so many different words for... Um, what, well, let's, let's call it the prison suitcase, um, which is where you would keep your valuables uh, in, if you were to take stuff in and out of prison and um, you were quite keen that nobody else found them there. Uh, so I'd say prison suitcase, although I'm not sure I could describe mine as a suitcase. I think it's probably more of a pencil case, but um, <laughs> yeah, pr the prison suitcase is my favourite. Good. And finally, we're joined by Paul Sinner, an acclaimed comedian, a regular on ITV's The Chase, as I know to my cost. <laughs> let it go, Joe. Let, let it go. Let it go. <laughs> we were £100,000 up, and then the last minute of the show came. I didn't follow the rules, well, as perhaps as closely as I should have done. And a moment later, we were down to £2,000. We lost £98,000 as a result of being up against you. Is that the way the game's supposed to work? The rules are quite simple, Giles. Answer as many questions as possible. That's where you went wrong. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> now, Paul, like many a funny man before you, uh, you were once a qualified doctor, but you decided to do something useful with your life instead. <laughs> um, what is your favourite word from the lexicon of medicine from your old days? Um, actually, it's a relatively new word, and like nearly all the most beautiful words in the English language, it comes from German, and um, the, the word is Witzelschucht which is one of the most unusual symptoms there is in the medical lexicon. Uh, and it's quite sad in that you have to have a frontal lobe tumour or a blow to your frontal lobe of the brain to have this symptom. But it means that you only talk in puns and long-winded stories. <laughs> I think... <laughs> think back, Giles. When were you hit? Um... <laughs> <laughs> anyway, well, let's play the game now. We're going to begin, as always, with our letter of the week round, and we've managed to secure the services of a very popular letter this week. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome the letter A? And here she comes. 
advancing alluringly down the wordaholics catwalk, the letter A. Here she is in her uppercase form with two sweeping diagonal lines framing an elegant cross piece. And let me tell you, if you get on the wrong side of the letter A, you'll find she's a very cross piece indeed. She's ambitious, ambidextrous, and currently under an asbo for arson. Would you please give a round of applause for the letter A? Lloyd Langford, you're the first to be awarded an A, and here is your question. Why do we call avocados avocados? I think I know this, but I'm going to have to be very delicate in how I explain it. I think you do know it, then. <laughs> uh, it is from... Is it Spanish? Or it's Central American? I think it is uh, because of their perceived resemblance to the male testicles. As opposed to the female testicles. Yeah. <laughs> Too much information, Holly. <laughs> if you think about it as well, it kind of makes sense because um, they're both easily bruised <laughs> and their introduction will liven up any salad. <laughs> You're completely right, and you're going to score two full points for that, Lloyd. Uh, it is actually from the Spanish aguacate, which in turn comes from the Aztec word aquati, which does indeed mean testicles. <laughs> Natalie Haynes, here's your A. Why do we describe a sneeze using the word a tissue? Um, because it's the only reflex action that allows you to say what you need. No. <laughs> It sounds like onomatopoeia, but there's more to it than that. A tissue is an anglicization of the French a tes which literally means, bless you, a tes Yeah, so, of course, the word, yeah, 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 right. <laughs> Tune in to Wordaholics, you live and learn, then, of course, you die and forget it all. <laughs> Indeed, the word a tissue always brings to mind for me ring-a-ring of -ring roses with the famous line, a tissue, a tissue, we all fall down, which, of course, references the Kleenex Wars of 1635. <laughs> Holly, according to a definition recently added to the Oxford English Dictionary, what would you be doing if you were astroturfing? Astroturf is like fake grass. So is it this sort of opposite of... Waxing. Is it if a man, <laughs> like if a man wants to have an augmented hairy chest, he might astroturf himself? Is it, is that what it is? A chest wig. Yeah, a chest wig. With matching underarm toupees. <laughs> All made of astroturf. Yeah. That's, yeah, your, yeah. that's your notion. Well, not astroturf, but just the idea of using yeah. Yeah. fake Fakings. Like um, Wayne Rooney did to his head. Yeah, he astroturfed his head, exactly. Is that, is that what it means? Holly, you have failed to score. Um, um, <laughs> let me give you a clue. Much it, like it, Wayne Rooney. It, <laughs> it's, it's malign and online astroturfing. That's my clue for you. Malign and... Online. I think it is people who pretend to be... Um, grassroots campaigners. I think it's people who are pretending to be ordinary, innocent, everyday members of the public and are actually um, paid stooges uh, employed by either companies or political parties or whatever. You get a pair of bonuses there because that's a comprehensive answer. It is indeed a marketing expression relating to online campaigns. If you go on the internet and post a positive message about something you're advertising but you pretend to be a member of the public, then what you're doing is astroturfing. Uh, as, we, as Holly rightly said, AstroTurf is a material used in sports pitches. It's a reminder here for Radio 4 listeners. Sports are activities um, you undertake <laughs> to get the heart rate up, you know? <laughs> like listening to any questions. <laughs> Finally, Paul, your team needs to score. What was the original meaning of the word assassin? I think I've heard this in a quiz, uh, but I don't actually know if it's true. But I think assassins comes from the same derivation as hashish, uh, in the sense that there was an Islamic sect circa 1000, 1100, called the Assassins, and they were trained killers, but they were also regular users of the drug hashish. Although, I must admit, if I was hiring trained killers, 
hashish would probably be the last thing that I was hoping. You, you, don't, you don't want train killers who've lost their reflexes, their sense of position, and have a tendency to have a sudden sense of absolute goodwill. Um, <laughs> It, 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 it seems like poor training to be a, a hired killer, but I think it's, it's Arabic, it's to do with hashish, and that's why they're called assassins. A comprehensive, coherent answer with a comical twist, two points with a bonus, three in all. Well done. <laughs> Paul, those absolutely spot on, and they were very easy to track down after the assassination because they were the people queuing for biscuits in the all night garage. <laughs> this next round is about aptronyms, defined in the 1920s as names that are particularly appropriate for their owners. For example, Usain Bolt is an apt name for a sprinter. Bolt, huh? Bob Flowdew is a good name for a gardener, and not forgetting Eric Pickles who sleeps in that big jar of vinegar. <laughs> now it's time for our panel to come up with some of their own aptronyms. There are many celebrities who are stuck doing the wrong job, so to help them out, I'd like you to suggest what they should really be doing based on their names. Natalie. Well, if we're sticking with politicians, um, Nick Clegg should uh, steal prosthetic limbs. <laughs> Which, thanks to Atos, he's almost certainly about to start doing. <laughs> I merely mention I think, it. Uh, I think Janet Street Porter should have to ho help old ladies with their bags across the road. <laughs> <laughs> a a double bonus, Holly, that's so good. I don't know why, but Roger Moore springs to mind. <laughs> <laughs> There's an ITV newsreader called Nina Nana, and uh, I've always thought she should be an ambulance driver. So it's the end of the round and time to look at the scores, and I can tell you that Paul and Holly are in second place with nine points, which means the leaders are Natalie and Lloyd, because they've got eleven! This next round is called You Can't Say That, and it's all about situations we don't have a word for, but other countries do. Lloyd Langford, we're going to start with you. What do you suppose is the meaning of the Persian word hazudust? <laughs> it sounds like mess in your domicile, the way you say it. Like you say, I need to do some spring cleaning because there's too much hazudust. <laughs> I'm going to give you some options, Lloyd, to help you. Is it A, a pair of remarkably ostentatious trousers? <laughs> B, a thief who steals for the thrill and not the financial gain? Or C, a sickly, sweet, cream-based soft drink inexplicably popular with Persian pensioners? Durst. <laughs> I'll go for the trousers, why not? You're going for a, A, a pair of remarkably ostentatious trousers. You're wrong. It's B, a harzadust is someone who steals something of no value to themselves or anyone else, just for the sake of it. Okay. On the subject of which, the complete series of wordaholics can currently be <laughs> illegally downloaded from the internet. <laughs> <laughs> Natalie Haynes, you're up next, and it's an Indonesian word for you. What would you be doing if you were begadang? I think it's begadang, and I think it's the opening chord of every Indonesian rock song. <laughs> I'll give you some alternatives. Would you be A, talking the whole night through, B, borrowing something with absolutely no intention of giving it back, or C, partaking in the new dance craze that's sweeping the nation? Uh, I think borrowing something with no intention of giving it back is theft, and we do have a word for it. It's theft. <laughs> um, what was the last one? A dance craze sweeping the nation, by which we mean Indonesia. Or is it talking the whole night no, through? No, the first one. Talking the whole night through. It is. Talking the whole night through. You get a couple of points for that. My wife and I actually often stay up talking through the night, regardless of her attempts to stop me. We just keep going. <laughs> a couple of points for you there, Natalie. Holly, here's one for you. It's an Inuit word. <laughs> what would you be doing if you were uh, Itsu Arpok? Well, I know that um, Eskimos have... 50 words for snow, but um, there's only one word for de-icer. <laughs> <laughs> Is 
that what it means? That's not what it means. So I'm going to give you a trio of alternatives. Would you be A, stealing food from people's plates in order to sate your own raging hunger? B, continually rushing out of the door in excited expectation of a guest? Or C, getting down to the new dance craze that's sweeping the nation? <laughs> I actually, that happened to me recently. Um, I was in a restaurant and um, suddenly a table became available so I sat down and some, you know, when you've got somebody else's leftovers left on the plate and I was starving hungry. I was so hungry and the waiter completely ignored me so I sort of ate a couple of bits of chorizo off the side of the plate and I know, judge me, I don't care, it was free food. And um, <laughs> when I noticed there was like a breadstick left in the basket and I ate that and it was just as I was finishing off... Uh, a couple of um, olives and a bit of um, manchego cheese that the couple came back from their cigarette. <laughs> <laughs> so I hope it's that. Is that what it is? Did this incident occur in Greenland? It, but this is an Inuit word. Well, I need this word if it did happen. Uh, oh, I like that's it. That's the point. You yeah. need this word. Stealing food from other people's plates in order to sate your own raging hunger. I hope this it's is it. It's happened to you, but that is not oh. what happened in this instance. <laughs> Don't worry, you are going to get a bonus point for that interesting story. But to itsu arpok is to repeatedly go outside to see if someone is coming. Oh, I'm just going to itsu arpok. Oh. <laughs> When those are little, aren't they, in your <laughs> head? Yeah. They're little people. <laughs> Sounds like Pingu to me. Yeah. <laughs> it's because it's so cold out there, my voice has risen. You know? uh, I've actually been to Greenland to meet the Inuits, and indeed when those Eskimos have a party, they really do let themselves go. There's nothing more jolly than an out-of-it Inuit. <laughs> uh, and finally, Paul, we have a German word for you. Oh, I know I you're German into your words. German lingo. What do you suppose is a... And as people who know German will know, they often combine a whole number of words. Well, that's what I'm thinking. Um, yeah. Hand. I'm going to stick my neck out here and say hand. <laughs> shoe. Shoe. Hand shoe. Glove. Uh, schnee. Bow. Snow ball. What was the last bit? Werfer. Right. I mean, the Germans are very logical people, uh, and it would be just like them to introduce a degree of health and safety to a children's pastime. So um, I'm going to go for it. I'm going to say it's uh, the wearing of gloves when playing with snow or snowball fighting or something along, something along those lines. But you <laughs> are absolutely spot on, a, a hunch... Shu Schnee Balferfer is literally someone who wears gloves when they are throwing snowballs, so they are a snowball glove wearer. <laughs> <laughs> a coward, and it's a metaphor. A Han Shu Schnee Balverfa is literally someone who wears gloves when they're throwing snowballs. So we call cowards yellow. But if you find yourself throwing yellow snowballs, you probably should be wearing gloves. <laughs> So at the end of that round, we can see that Paul and Holly are still trailing on 18, but Natalie and Lloyd only just ahead on 21. Now, obviously, here at Wordholics, we love all kinds of words, new and old, but it takes a special kind of person to invent their own words, someone of the calibre of a Shakespeare or a Prescott. So, in this round, I'd like our panel to come up with their very own word, something that we don't even know we need until we hear it. Holly, you get to go first, so please tell us a word you think we're crying out for. I think there should be a word for somebody who's incredibly badly behaved and a bit of a knob, uh, but makes so much money for their company that they can't be sacked. And I propose a Clarkson. <laughs> I don't understand the thinking there, but the audience seemed to appreciate it. <laughs> so we're going to get a couple of points. Paul, what have you brought us? Um, well, there's a lot of weird words for different crimes, but society changes, the nature of what the worst crime is changes. And this is a word for what I think is the worst crime, and the word is mescalation. And it's the crime of causing a mess by standing on the wrong side of an escalator. <laughs> 
That's nice. Lloyd, a new word from you, please. My new word is trage. Trage. That is uh, the impotent fury you feel when someone sits next to you on the train. <laughs> we like trage, so Lloyd, you get a couple of points there. Natalie, what about you? Um, this is something which has only started to happen to me quite recently because I used to be efficient and it's all gone wrong. Um, and so now I need a word for the moment when um, somebody emails or perhaps texts you and says, oh, hi, are you very far away? And you realise that you've forgotten to go and meet the person that you've arranged to meet. Um, and I've genuinely never needed it until about the last year. So I am coining appointmentia. Um, <laughs> Oh, that is actually a very useful word, isn't it? it but in a really bad way. I'd really rather not need it, but I do need it. Good. I liked all of those. In fact, I shall pop my favourites in this envelope here and send them to Susie Dent in Dictionary Corner, along with this lock of hair. <laughs> <laughs> the English language is always gaining new words, and I was reflecting only this morning how wonderful and creative new forms of language can be as I twit-picked a selfie while twerking like I've never twerked before. <laughs> but as new words appear, old words have to make way for them. Our final round, New Words for Old, is a celebration of the language of the past. This week's words come from a real classic, the very first edition of Webster's Dictionary, published in 1828. Webster was the first dictionary to include American spellings, or, as they're known in this country, mistakes. <laughs> I'm only teasing, it's just my traditional British sense of humour. <laughs> Paul Sinner, what does or did it mean to dwall? D-W-A-U-L. Um, is it a misdiagnosed dwarf who's actually quite tall? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not. Let me give you a multiple choice here. Does it mean, A, to be downbeat and depressed? B, to be delirious and incoherent, or C, to be particularly gifted at finding sources of underground water. <laughs> <laughs> oh, to dwell. Um, uh, it could be any of those. I quite like those. Um, I'm going to take a wild stab at delirious. It's a wild stab, but it gets you the full marks. It's B, to be dwell is to be delirious. <laughs> and, of course, if you become delirious as a result of too much worry then uh, what you've got is a load-bearing dwarl. <laughs> Lloyd Langford, under what circumstances would you visit a corn? K-A-W-N. Sounds like yawn. So is it somewhere you would go to relax, like a, a hostel or a sort of tavern or an opium den? You obviously know this. You know the answer because you've got the answer really completely spot on. Uh, a corn is indeed uh, somewhere where you go to relax. Uh, it is, well, opium and alcohol are there. It is a Turkish public house uh, of ancient times. A corn. <laughs> Natalie, what is a Lindsay Woolsey? Is it Lindsay Lohan's pet sheep? <laughs> A Lindsay Woolsey, is it A, a mix of linen and wool, B, a greased sheep that is bred to provide wool, or C, the sack upon which the Lord Chancellor sits at Westminster that contains wool? It's the first one, the linen and wool one, because it's basically the same word. Lindsay Woolsey, linen, wool. It's that one. Is yep. it that one? You oh, brilliant. Four marks. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Yes, it is indeed A. A Lindsay Woolsey, well, it's obvious really, it's a mix of linen and wool and it's metaphorically used to mean something or someone who is, to quote Noah Webster, vile, mean and composed of different and unsuitable parts. So that's the, the clever bit. Ah, oh, you're supposed really... to mix fabrics for yeah, ages, huh? exactly. It does also sound very much like the kind of person you'd find appearing in the archers. Have you seen, have you seen that new barmaid down at the bowl? What? You mean the one who seems to be vile, mean, and composed of different and unsuitable parts? <laughs> That's right, Lindsay Woolsey. <laughs> so a couple of points for you, Natalie. Congratulations. And finally, Holly Walsh. What on earth is a jelly bag? Is it 
I mean, this is presumably before boob jobs and the like. Is it? Yes, this is the early 18. Yeah. But people still like bucks and maids. Is it um, some kind of uh, breast augmentation that ladies could wear to give themselves a fuller figure? Well, they, actually, they'd put in a couple of jelly bags. That's not... They certainly could have used it for that purpose. So um, I suppose I have to give you a couple of marks there. Let me give you the alternatives, because you've really got it. Do you suppose it's A, a spineless person, a jelly bag, B, the bladder of a cow, or C, a bag full of jelly? So I suppose B or C could be used for the purpose you've described. Um, I mean, you could use a spineless person as well, a couple of them. But I... yeah, I'm not going to fight back and say, no, I don't want to. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm going to go with the bag of jelly just because it's so obvious. It is so obvious, and the obvious is sometimes the right answer. A jelly bag is purely and simply a bag in which jelly is distilled. Uh, you're absolutely right, you get two points for that. And I love a bowl of jelly. It's by far my favourite of all the puddings made from hooves. <laughs> So we have come to the end of another violation of the vernacular and it's my pleasure to announce that in second place this week we have Paul and Holly. So the winners are Natalie and Lloyd. A night in a Turkish public house awaits our winners while for the losers, what can I say, must be a real kick in the avocados. <laughs> Now, winners, Natalie and Lloyd, before you go, is there a word you'd use to describe your wordaholics experience? Just one word? Um, I'm going to go with anti-trade, because I like saying by Lloyd, he, he wins. <laughs> so. And Lloyd? Uh, it was a phrase you said, greased sheep. <laughs> <laughs> uh, have you got a word that you would describe your experience with Holly? As a loser, what is Well, it? I really wanted to be, have the aptronym of Michael Winner. So you'd like to be Michael Winner? I'd love not, to be Michael Winner. Do you know, I don't think I've ever heard anybody ever say that. <laughs> <laughs> OK, Paul. What's, what's your one word? It's, it's quite simple. This show has been incredibly witzel sucktastic <laughs> I think it has been in every sense. So that's it from this week's Wordaholics. Will you please thank one more time our wonderful guests, Lloyd Langford, Natalie Haynes, Holly Walsh and Paul Sinner. Until next time, goodbye. <laughs> you have been listening to Wordaholics, chaired by me, Charles Brandreth. It's written by John Hunter and James Kettle. The producer is Claire Jones. Claire Jones.